right. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the adult Sunday school class here at uh, Victor Baptist Church. Uh, I just want to say uh, it's good to be back. Uh, thank you for all the prayers um, and everything that, uh, that you guys have prayed for us for. Um, we had safe travels. Uh, couldn't complain. For some reason, uh, every time we travel home and we travel through Illinois, we hit a huge rainstorm. Um, I had to first remember what rain looked like because we haven't had it in a while. Um, but then uh, we, we got through it safely. Um, again, just thanks for the prayers. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to continue up. We're going to finish uh, the foundations course this week and next week or the last two lessons. Um, and so uh, we, we kind of took a break, obviously, uh, because we were on vacation. Um, and so uh, we're going to re- really turn our focus to uh, the, the end of this, the, this class. We're going to really turn our focus to the eternal uh, and, and what's coming up um, this week, we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about what that is, why it's very important for us as Christians, uh, and then we're going to talk about the second coming of Christ, which is if you were, if, if God were to have a calendar, the date that would be circled on His calendar would be the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, when when He comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and 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 is ruling. Um, and so we'll talk about that next week. And so, so really, it, the progression of this class is really just who God is, who we are, how we get saved. You know, once we're saved, what does that mean? What does that look like? And then we talked about what does the Christian walk look like? What, what, what are some things associated with that? And now we're going to talk about, well, now that we're walking as Christians, now that we are Christians and we should be walking as such, uh, what's going to happen to us in the future? And so we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Let's read in Colossians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 27. We'll start in verse 27. It says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, talking about Jesus Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to this working, which worketh in me mightily. Let's go ahead and pray, uh, and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the ability to come uh, before you. Lord, we thank you uh, that as we study about the judgment seat, Lord, that we we can get some things and and we can get our minds set on thee, Lord, so that we can follow after you and, and do what you want us to do. And Lord, we just thank you for, for the ability to come here this morning to study out of your word. And Lord, we pray that whatever is said and done here this morning gives you glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Here, here Paul is saying we preach Jesus Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Right? That, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, this is all in, in, in part of the introduction. Um, you know, it says, knowing therefore the terror, in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust are also made manifest in your consciences. So what, what, this, what he's talking about in the context, we'll go back to verse 10 uh, and during the lesson. Right, he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. You know, there's going to be fire at this judgment. You know, the, our works are going to be tried by fire, and, and fire is a terrible thing if you've ever been burned. You know, Henry, uh, we're at my mom's house, and my mom's oven is just the right height for Henry to reach up and over and to grab things off of. And so when we're at her house, we're, we're cooking some bacon or we're cooking something, and Henry goes over and tries to reach, and we say, Henry, stop, that's hot. And so now whenever he walks by a stove or whenever he walks by a pan cooking, he always goes hot, 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 right? He knows there's something that could hurt him with something being hot. You know, there, we're, we're going to talk about this fire. We're going to talk about these, th- this trial of our works. Uh, but, but we need to persuade men. You know, it, it's our job as pastors to prepare the flock for the future judgment, for, for the, the coming of eternity, not necessarily 
you know, focusing down here on this earth and the flesh and, and just everything down here, but, but what's going to come, right? Because cause there's a lot of people who are focused on the here and now, but that's all going to go away. You know, that's all going to go away, and, and there's going to be a coming judgment um, that we're going to look at. And so the first part of the lesson, we're going to talk about judgment. You know, judgment is a matter of life. Is, is, so the first part is judgment is a matter of life. You know, despite what people think about it, it happens. You know, you, you, you constantly hear people uh, in the world today, well, don't judge me. You can't judge me. Don't judge me. But, you know, judgment is, is a matter of life. It surrounds us, you know, especially as Christians. It surrounds us. You know, in Hebrews 12, it says we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, right? There's people watching us and judging us by what we do every day. You know, we make... Ju- we make judgments every day. Whether you, you think that you don't judge or not, we make judgments every day. You know, from the clothes we wear to the food we eat, that is a judgment. We might not think of it as such, but it is. You know, I judge this suit over all the other suits that I have to wear today. You know, I judge the bowl of cereal that I ate over the eggs and bacon. You know, we, we make these, these might seem minor judgments, but they're still judgments. You know, the, these judgments stem from minor judgments, like we said, clothes and food, to major judgments. Should I have this person as a friend? Should I be walking this way? Right? Those are some major judgments. Let's go to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. You know, part of God's nature is this perfect judgment. We talked about this uh, in way back in lesson number one, about God is a perfect judge. And he is. He's a righteous judge. Genesis 18, we get the story of Abraham. The, the three guys come to Abraham, and, and, he, and he kills the calf, and he feeds them, and he says, hey, we're going to go up to, to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if the sin that's come up before God is actually as bad as it is. And Abraham here pleads with God You know, where he says, if 50 righteous be found within the city, would you destroy it? How about 40 and 30 and all the way down to 10? But in verse 25, and this is what Abraham says about God. It says, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Absolutely. Our God is a righteous God and, and he's a righteous judge, but part of his nature is judgment. You know, in Proverbs 29, the, the, the thing there, it says all, right, all, all judgment comes from God. You know, and so as Christians, right, since, since part of God's nature is his perfect judgment, as Christians, right, we have God in us. We read that in Colossians chapter 1. We have Jesus Christ in us. As Christians, there are things we should judge. Notice I said things, actions, doctrines. Those are things that we can judge. I did not say motives, right? I did not say necessarily people. Why? Because we can't see the heart, right? So it's hard for us to judge motives. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's hard for us to judge motives because we don't see the full picture, we don't see the heart. Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. Uh, we'll read verse one, then we'll skip down to verse five. Uh, verse one it says, "This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come." And then verse five. We'll skip down to verse five. It says, "Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof." From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, it says for having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, right? What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to judge. And then it says from such debate with them until you win. That's not what it says. It it doesn't say debate with them until you win and you show that you're right and they're wrong. No, what it says is from such turn away. 
Because what happens is, as Christians, is we tend to, to, to get into these arguments, you know, and, and we get pulled down to where they are. You know, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know, there, there's some things, but it's a doctrine, right? Having a form of godliness, right? They look good on the outside, but denying the power thereof, but they don't actually follow the God that gives them the power. So they have no power, right? If you look in the previous, it, it, it's quite interesting. If you look at the, the previous section, it, it talks about lovers of themselves. It talks about being blasphemers. It talks about being unthankful, right? We can see a person who is unthankful. You can tell if a person is unthankful by how they react when they're given something, right? That, that's a person who is having an ungrateful attitude. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, you know, it says, for the, uh, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. And, and if we go back earlier in the chapter, it talks about uh, people who teach that, God, that, that gain is godliness in verse 5, right? That the more you make, uh, the more godly you must be, right? Like, oh, hey, I'm going to pray in the, the, the Lamborghini, or I'm going to pray in all the money, right? He says, but these things, oh man, flee these things. Why? Because they're going to affect us, and they're going to affect what we believe doctrinally and on the Bible. And what, what we're going to see is they're going to take our eyes off of where they need to be, right? This is why we have to judge these things, is because what we're going to see is there's coming a judgment day for us as Christians, and we need to have our eyes set on that and prepare for it. And that if things take our eyes from it, then we won't be as prepared as we should. So obviously, what's the basis of judgment? The basis of judgment is the Bible. You know, in John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The basis of our judgment is the Bible, which is why in, we'll talk about Romans 14, right, where it talks about those things that are, that are not explicitly stated in here, right, those convictions that we should be careful in judging another's convictions because it isn't explicitly stated in the Bible. And so that is the basis of our judgment is the Bible. There are different judgments spoken of in the scripture. We're going to look at four of them briefly, and we're going to focus in on the last one. The first one is the judgment on sin, right? The judgment on sin. Galatians chapter 3. This occurred at Calvary. Galatians chapter 3 in verse 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every man that hangeth on the tree. Right? This, this judgment on sin occurred at Calvary. So if you are saved, you have already had your sins judged. They were judged at Calvary when God poured the cup of wrath on Jesus Christ while he was on the cross. That's where our sins are judged. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The second judgment we'll see is a self-judgment, right? And, and this is actually, before we can start judging other things out there, we need to judge ourselves first. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, it says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause are many weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Right? So... If we judge ourselves, we should not be judged by the men around us, right? If we judge ourselves and how we walk, then we're not going to be judged because we, we already see through the, the scripture of what's going on. You know, it's a daily checkup for fellowship. But then it says, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, right? Because we're his child. You know, as parents, we like, like I said, when Henry walked and was about to judge, judge, uh, touch the stove, I judged his actions and said, hey, that's probably not going to end well. And so then I chastened him, and now he doesn't go near the stove anymore. And so that's what the Lord does for us. But we need to start with ourselves. That's a self-judgment. 
Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Let's turn there. Verse 12. If you are not saved, if a person is not saved, they do not have their sins obviously judged on Calvary. This is where their sins get judged. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. This is the judgment for the unsaved. Verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In verse 11 it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Right? This is known as the great white throne judgment. We're actually going to talk about it next week because it deals with the second coming of Christ and, and, and the future uh, and what's going to take place. But this is the judgment of the unsaved. And then lastly, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, and we'll, we'll be there for a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So we have a judgment on sin. We have a judgment on self. We have a judgment of the unsaved. And now we're going to have a judgment of a servant. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed uh, by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. And so this judgment is the judgment of our service. The judgment of service as a Christian takes place at, at what is known as the judgment seat of Christ. You know, the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen. Uh, it, it, it is going to be an individual judgment. We are not going to be going in by pairs. We're not going to be going in as a church. We are going to be going in as individuals. And so what will be judged at this judgment? The first thing that's going to be judged, I think, is our service. You know, what we do, the things that we do, what we do for Christ, you know, our works, if you will. Notice in verse 15 that things could, will be burned up, but you yourself are saved, yet so as by fire. We are still getting to heaven. What I'm not saying is we go up to this judgment, everything gets burned away, and we don't get heaven. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you have to work to keep your salvation. I'm not saying that you have to work to be saved. I am saying that once you are saved, you now have to work. If you look at those big, huge uh, salvation passages that we use, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Romans 10, uh, 14, you know, those large, uh, th those very good salvation passages, the p very next verse always deals with work, right? You know, in Romans 10, it talks about how will they hear without a preacher, right? That's a work, to go out and give the work. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship. There's work. So after salvation comes work, comes service. So our service is judged. We covered this in lesson number 13. What else is, what else is uh, uh, judged up there? I think our liberty is judged, according to Romans 14. Right? Why are you judging another man, another man's servant for what they think? Right? Why, why are you judging that? Because you will be judged for that. You know, this is uh, how we do it. Right? This is what, what, how we live our lives, really, is the liberty. is because you know, we, we have the liberty to, to do right. And so our service... Our liberty, that was covered in lesson number 13, if you want to go back and, and study that out. And then lastly, let's turn here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and this is our stewardship. You know, so our service, our liberty, and our stewardship. You know, when we get saved, God gives us things. I mean, God gives us things all the time. Being a good steward is taking care of what we have been given. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, 
It says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, And then shall every man have praise of God. You know, there's going to be coming a time where we will stand before Jesus Christ and we will be judged on our stewardship of, in in 1 Corinthians 4, of the mysteries of God. You know, we're not going to take the time, because we don't have the time, to to go through all the mysteries. There's about seven mysteries of, uh, uh, depending on how you count it, there's about seven mysteries of, uh, in, in the Bible of God. And if you look, though, if you are not being faithful to the mysteries, that is where you bring heresy into the church. And that is where you bring heresy. One of the mysteries is the rapture, right? In, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be gone. That is a mystery. Another mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory we read about in Colossians chapter 1, right? But, but if we don't keep these mysteries, if we don't teach these mysteries, if we don't be good, faithful stewards and study them out and look at them, then that's where heresies are being taught. And we will be judged on that. All of us. Not just the pastors behind the pulpit. So what are the criteria for the judgment? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because, you know, God just doesn't say, hey guys, uh, we're going to give you, um, here, here, you're going to stand before me in judgment, um, but I'm not going to actually tell you how you are going to be judged. Because that would be unfair. So what are the criteria for the judgment? Well, I will tell you first what will be judged. You don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 12, verse 48, it says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Right? We're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. We're going to be judged by the word of God in heaven. That is going to be the basis of our judgment. You know, since this is going to be our judge, shouldn't we let this then guide us? Right? Because this is going to be our judge, and so we should let this guide us because everything that we will need to present ourselves before Christ is in here. And so this is why we need to stick with this book. So what's the first thing that the the criteria of our judgment is going to be our motives? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I always thought, you know, when, when, when I would read through this and I, and I would study some stuff out, I always thought the scariest verses in the Bible were those that saying we would have to account for every idle word or every idle thought that we've ever thought or spoke. And those are pretty scary verses, right? Those, those, those times where we've thought things we shouldn't have or we said things that we shouldn't have, we are going to have to account for those in front of Jesus Christ. But these are even scarier, I think. Uh, Chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, we talked about being a steward, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, look at all the alls there, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You know, we, we, we read these verses, and, and, and what I, here's what I am not saying, is what I am not saying is to serve God, you have to have the perfect motives all the time, right? Because I'm going to tell you right now, there are times that you know, our motives might be a little bit off, but we still do the things that we're supposed to do because God wants us to do them. Um, however, if we are constantly doing things with the wrong motives, then our works, when we get up in front of Jesus Christ, will be burned away. 
You know, the, the Bible talks about gold, silver, precious stones, and then it says wood, hay, stubble. That wood, hay, stubble are dead things. You know, dead trees, dead grass, dead other stuff, right? That we've done for the dead man, that we've done for us. That, that the reason why we served was so that we could get the glory. You know, our love of God is a motive to do things. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says the love of God constraineth us. Right? This is why we do what we do. Who, when we serve, the, the question we should constantly ask is, hey, I'm about to do this thing. Who would I want to see me right, doing this thing? If my answer to that is, well, I only care if God sees me doing this thing, or, or I'm only doing this for God, I don't care if anybody sees me, uh, that's a pretty good motive for doing something. However, if we do something and we say, well, you know what, I really hope that the church is packed out, and I can get a, a, a route, you know, a standing ovation, and, and I can, you know, there's your motive. Right? You'll get your reward. God says you'll get a reward. We'll talk about the rewards. You'll get your reward. It'll just be down here. Fleshly. Earthy. It won't last eternity. You know, sometimes, and here's the other thing, sometimes not doing something is actually what God wants us to do. You know, if we look at the story of Mary and Martha, it says Mary chose the better part, right? Mary chose to sit in a time where she should be sitting instead of a time when she should be serving. A lot of times what we do is we just push through uh, and, and we don't listen to what God wants us to do. And so we think that God wants us just to go serve, 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 and, and serving is a good thing. But sometimes we have to sit. Sometimes we have to recharge, you know, let's go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. You know, our motives will be a criteria for the judgment. You know what else will be a criteria for the judgment? How we treat others. How we treat others. Romans chapter 13, I meant 14, let's see here, Romans, uh, Romans 12, excuse me, there's a typo in my notes, Romans chapter 12, I was like there's no 21 verses in Romans 13, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Right? Here's some criteria for what, with which we will be judged, right? with, with how we can use our liberty uh, as Christians. Uh, it's how we treat others. You know, in, in Colossians chapter 3, end of Colossians chapter 3, it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And proceeding right before it is how we deal with our family members. Right? And, and so Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same, same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And, and then, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst... Give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with yelling and screaming and, and trying to be, you know, trying to, no, overcome evil with good. You know, there are times, you know, but, but, but you might be asking yourself, man, that's a hard list. It is a hard list. You know how you accomplish this list? You walk in the Spirit. You set your mind on the judgment seat of Christ. You set your mind on what God wants us to do. And, hey, I'm going to be responsible with how I use my liberty. I'm going to be responsible with how I walk. This is what God tells me to do. I need to do it. And, you know, there are times in our lives where maybe 
our love necessarily isn't without dissimulation or or you know we might not necessarily be kindly affection one to another and what happens is there's that holy spirit that will come in and will say hey you need to change this you know you need to change this and it, it is up to us as christians to listen to the holy spirit and then to change right not deny the power thereof right that's where the power comes in the power comes in is the holy spirit working through us in our lives all right, so that's what we're going to be judged on. Those are, those are some of the criteria for judgment. So what are the rewards, right? Because there are rewards to this judgment. You know, to give in return, you know, good or evil is what the definition of a return is, or a reward is, or a recompense, right? We are, a reward is something you earn for doing something. And so the Bible talks about gold, silver, and precious stones in 1 Corinthians 3. We read that. And these are the rewards that are used to build upon the foundation that is Jesus Christ. We're going to see... Hopefully, we'll move, pre- well, yeah. I say we'll move pretty quickly through these crowns, but I doubt it. But we'll see what these rewards are for, right? And, and that they're not for us, no matter what we think about them. They're not for us. But they're also crowns. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. We'll read it here. They're also crowns at this judgment. Now, we're going to look at five crowns. There is some debate, just to let you guys know, we'll be in verse 10. There, there is some uh, debate on, on whether there's a couple more crowns that you can pull out of uh, Psalms and in Proverbs. You know, it says a, a, a godly wife is a crown to her husband. It says the, the hoary head when found in righteousness is a crown, right? And so some people might argue with those. They might argue that those are crowns that will be up here. I don't know. I'm just sticking with the ones uh, that are in the, the New Testament that say crown of something or that, that use the word crown. Um, we, we can talk about it later if you want to talk about it. But in, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and thy, for thy pleasure they are and were created. Right? So there are crowns. There. So there are five different crowns that we're going to look at. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And what we're going to see are what these crowns are. We're going to start in verse 7. You know, the, the first crown we're going to see is the crown of righteousness. You know, the crown of righteousness is given to those who love his appearing. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it says, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also, or all them also that love his appearing. Now I've always I've always had that question, right? Is what does that mean to love his appearing? Right? I I you know, I want Jesus Christ to come back, right? I mean, I mean, that is the major doctrine in the Bible is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I want him to come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. I want him to, to establish his throne on this earth. I love his appearing. But if you look, there's a henceforth, right? It says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Why is there laid up a crown of righteousness for Paul in 2 Timothy? Because of verse 7. Because he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You know what it means to love the Lord's appearing? To want him to come back, but while we're waiting for him to come back, to do what he wants us to do. You know, Paul says, I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. You know, I, I, I have fought a good fight. What Paul did not do to love his appearing was pull out a lawn chair, sit in it, and do nothing. Paul continued to work. Right? That's what it means to love his appearing. Right? Uh, you know, the last prayer in the Bible is about his appearing. It is a good thing to pray for the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, to pray for us as Christians to be raptured out of here. But, our des- but, but while we are waiting, we need to serve him. You know, in Luke 21, it says, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. It doesn't say look around and, and try to pick out and, and figure out what's going on around us. It says look up. Right? It's that eternal mindset. It's that, it's that looking up 
Because Paul knew there is something in the future that is going to happen. And he says, because of that, I now have a crown of righteousness laid up for me. That this is one that we should all be able to get. Right? It's because we all should be looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ and doing something for him while we wait. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. So we have the crown of righteousness. We have the crown of life in verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Talking to a church that is constantly under suffering, constantly under persecution, being thrown to the lions, being just beaten and whipped, and, and just, uh, just terrible things happening. Uh, it says, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know, this crown is also known as the martyr's crown. You know, in verse, you know, and, and this is given, so I, I've always thought about this, right? Because a lot of people say, well, this is the martyr's crown, and so then you have to die a martyr's death to get this crown. And I don't know if I, if I agree with that, because it says, be thou faithful unto death. It doesn't say death is a martyr. It doesn't say death is this. It says there's going to be persecution. That's earlier in the verse. And it says, and you shall have tribulation. It says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know, there are times in our Christian walk where we are met with a choice. Do I keep living for Christ, or do I just stop and live after the world? Depending on the choice we make, being faithful unto death, being constantly serving him, you know, giving up things for Christ, you know, living for Christ, you will lose some things. Family will forsake you. You know, you will lose some, uh, uh, not blessings, um, some money, you know, different opportunities, right? Living for Christ, you'll lose friends. But, you know, if you are faithful unto God, to the end. You know, in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 2, you know what God tells this church? Here's a church that's undergoing a lot of persecution. You know, many of them have been killed. And in verse 9, you know what God says? God says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. But then he says in parentheses, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Right? And then he says, hey, if you're faithful unto me. You know what? God knows what we're doing. You know, he says, you, you, you guys are suffering poverty, but thou art rich. If we were to compare that to today's church, you know, in Laodicea, the church here where it talks about in Revelation 3, it says, you think you're rich, but you're actually poor. Here's a church that's undergoing tribulation, and they say, hey, you're poor, but actually you're rich. Why? Because you are laying up treasures in heaven. That here comes a judgment day that you will have things survive the fire. So that's the crown of life. You know, in, in Matthew 16, it says denying ourselves. You know, denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following after him, being faithful unto death. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You know, I, I was as I was studying this and I was talking to Amy about it, uh, and, and I was just thinking through these crowns, and I'm just thinking, there's a lot in these crowns. I mean, there, there's just so much practical. I mean, you know, we always think that doctrine doesn't preach and, and that doctrine can be dry and not practical, but this is very practical, right? Because this is how we should be living our lives. You know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25, it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible, right? So the next crown is, is the incorruptible crown. Uh, this crown is given for biblically maintaining temperance or moderation in all matters. You know, just, just being temperate. You know where it says, now, uh, mastery is temperate in all things. If you look at the NBA right now, right, the NBA is playing, they're in their playoffs, but they're in what's known as the bubble, right? They're in their bubble. I mean, they haven't seen their family in months, and they've had to do so much stuff, right? But it says they're temperate. They're willing to go through that just to play a game. 
what are we willing to go through to get this incorruptible crown? Right? What are we willing to, to put down? You know, the key to this crown and, and getting this crown is surrender. You know, the, you know, surrendering to God, surrendering to his will, to put down our flesh to do what God wants us to do. You know, obviously this is balanced. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says there's a thorn presented to him in the flesh that the glory of God might be, um, you know, to glorify God. You know, to, to see that when we are made weak, he is made strong. It says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, this is balanced with our remembrance of some infirmities we have to the glorifying of God. You know, so this is the incorruptible crown. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So we have the, righteous, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the incorruptible crown. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 19. Uh, verse 18, it says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. This is the crown of rejoicing. This is known as, as the soul winner's crown, or the crown given for soul winning, um, and, and the reason why we believe that is when a soul is saved, according to Luke 15, or, or when, a, when a person comes back to God in Luke 15, there is rejoicing in heaven. Uh, there's rejoicing in heaven. Now, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. You know, in, in Proverbs it says, He that winneth souls is wise. You know, again, this is a crown that we all can earn, right? By, by trying to, to witness to people by trying to give them the gospel. We talked about being a witness and, and what that means and why we need to do it uh, a few lessons ago. You know, this is one treasure that we can build up. Now, some think, and, and I don't know if this is true or not, but some think that, that this crown will be the only crown with jewels in it. And what we mean by jewels is that those people who get saved are known as precious stones. We'll, we'll see it in here. And that they'll be placed in your crown. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Again, a lot of this... What will happen, what won't happen is conjecture because we're not there yet. Um, but in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know, it says gold, silver, precious stones, right? And so some people think that those precious stones are, are the, the souls uh, of people that will be saved, that, that, you know, you get a mark. I don't know if that's true or not, because you can imagine what will happen if we get up into heaven. One person's crown will have ten stones, another person's crown will have one, and that person with ten will be like, hey, I have ten. You only have one. And so maybe that's, that's not the case. Uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll look at the last crown. 1 Peter chapter 5. This is the crown of glory. This is a crown of glory. This is a crown given to those who faithfully occupy a past, pastoral role in leading and nurturing God's people. In, in the, the context of, of 1 Peter chapter 5, at least the first four verses you know, are all about a pastor. Uh, in verse uh, 4, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You know, and so this is a, you know, those who rule well, according to 1 Timothy, right? The elders that rule well are worthy of a double portion. You know, ministry, however, does not stop with those who are called to it, right? And when we are talking about the, the witnessing and being a personal witness, we talked about, you know, it's not just the pastors that are supposed to minister. It's everybody in the church, right? We are one body. We all can minister to different people. Now, those are the good rewards, right? The gold, silver, precious stone, we have crowns. And in the last couple minutes that I have, uh, we're going to talk about, just, we're just going to maybe tie a little bit of bow up or tie a bow on it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, it says, There will also be tears, 
right? So some, uh, another reward that, uh, reward that will be given out will be tears. And what do I mean by tears? I mean some rewards will be burned up in front of Jesus Christ, right? We will present our works to Christ. The fire will come in, and unfortunately what we think we will be presenting as gold, silver, precious stones is actually wood, hay, and stubble. And so all that will be burned away. We're still saved. We're still going to heaven, praise the Lord. But all that will be burned up. And when you see what you have worked for burned up, that is a sad occasion. There will be tears. In, Rome, in Revelation chapter 7, however, you know, we do have a God that will then wipe away all our tears. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, it says, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, there's two times God wipes away all their tears. Uh, I believe this is after the judgment seat of Christ. The, the one in Revelation chapter 20, I believe, is after the great white throne, when we see some of our loved ones thrown into everlasting fire. That, that's just what I believe. Again, it's not explicitly stated. A lot of this stuff uh, is conjecture. If you want to talk about it, I'll be glad to talk about it and give you the reasons why I believe the way I do. Um, and so some will see that their work is burned up. So rewards are earned. So then what are the rewards for? The, and, and finally, we'll conclude with this. Our rewards are not for us. You know, our rewards are not for us. They're not. All the things that we are given or have belong to God, right? Promotion comes not from the east, the west, or the south, but from the north, right? God gives us everything that we have, everything that we will have, and he just blesses us, right? We, we talked about God's goodness. The price that God paid to save our souls was the largest price anyone can pay. And so returning the crowns, returning those rewards back to Jesus Christ, to give him glory and honor is just a small payment for what he has done for us. And it's a small matter of worship. And so returning the crowns will be the way we give back glory and honor to the one who gave everything for us. Revelation chapter 4, I understand that in Revelation chapter 4, it's talking about the 4 and 20 elders who do this. I don't see why it would not extend to us in our worship of God and of Jesus Christ uh, in the future. And so, why should we care about this, right? That, that, that's the question, is why should we care about this? You know, this was pretty, pretty heavy on the doctrine, right? Doctrine is just truth. Uh, and, and so, why should we care? The judgment seat of Christ should always be at the forefront of our minds, right? As Christians, we should always be thinking about, there is coming a time where I will stand before Christ, and I will have to give an account of all these thoughts, of all these actions, of everything that I'm doing, because he has done so much for us. Knowing that we will be judged for these, it will help us keep in check, kind of, right? It'll help be an accountability for us. And, and, and we should want to constantly strive for Christ and be more like him. It helps us keep going. An eternal focus keeps our eyes on what really matters and our, 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 keeps our eyes off of the storm and on, on the Christ who can calm the storm and on the Christ who walks on the water uh, during the storm. And so uh, that's just a short lesson on the judgment seat of Christ. Short um, lesson on the judgment seat of Christ. Next week, we're going to talk about the second coming. And so we're going to talk a little bit about future events uh, within the church and, and, and what is going to happen, uh, uh, what's going to happen uh, to us. And then, I can't believe it, but then we'll be done with the class. We'll be done with the 16 weeks. And so then it'll just be time to to do something else or to start over at least for this class and so uh, if you have any questions please put them in the comments if you need the notes for any of the lessons let me know um, please and I would be glad to give them all these have been recorded and put on Facebook and sermon audio and and all that other stuff and so if you need any of the notes um, just let me know I'll be sure to send them to you uh, and so let's go and pray uh, and then we'll be done with uh, the Sunday school Lord thank you for Today, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for allowing us to look in your word at the judgment seat of Christ. And Lord, we, we pray that we can have our eyes focused on you and on this future event, Lord, that, uh, that is coming up. And Lord, we thank you for giving us the strength. Lord, we thank you for being with us and guiding us and, and just letting us and leading us in this life. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you allow us to, to lead a life that is worthy of you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all you've given to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.